I can only speak for myself. When I was stationed at Udorn Air Base, Thailand, there wasn't many days that I could really call joyful. But there was one. And that was the day when one of the fighter pilots came running into my office and said, Angel, they've got him. And with that, we rushed over to the flight line to the, wait for the search and rescue crew to bring Roger back to safety. And today, friends, we can say we've got him. Please give a warm welcome to Colonel Roger Rocker. Well, thank you, folks. Thanks, uh, Angel. If, uh, if you can't hear, raise your hand out there. I know we got a, a little bit of an echo. I'll try to slow down a little bit. These are two F-4s that are climbing out from Udorn. Uh, this is a 13th Squadron airplane, and just for those that may not uh, been around fighter airplanes, we do a lot of formation flying. And of course, uh, the F-4, anybody here in the Portland Guard, when they had F-4s, know that the, they burn a lot of fuel, so we do a lot of air refueling, a lot of formation flying, and this particular photo was taken uh, when I was going to uh, F-4 school, and that's near Flagstaff, Arizona, for that picture. Uh, again, a lot of formation flying. This particular uh, uh, configuration is uh, one of our uh, air combat loads. That's a 20-millimeter uh, uh, gun pod on the center line, and then 370-gallon fuel tanks. The long white missiles are sparrows, which are uh, radar-guided. And kind of an anomaly, the other two uh, with the red tails are uh, uh, AIM-4 Falcons, which weren't near as successful a, a miss, uh, missile over the uh, war, but we occasionally had those on our aircraft. Okay, this picture, uh, I'm going to spend a little bit of time on it. This was in the western edge of the demilitarized zone. Uh, so we're just in the south uh, Vietnam in the southwest corner. And I want to show the lay of the land here. Uh, for my little camping trip I'm going to talk about, was about 400 miles north of this location in north Vietnam. But the lay of the land uh, where I'm going to uh, land in their country without a visa uh, will be up in these high trees. So the, the upper third, as you can see, is uh, essentially original jungle. So fairly high trees, kind of similar to what you have here around Portland with the height of the trees. Down below, you see uh, its secondary growth. At some time, those people probably farmed it or tried to farm it. It got out of control or too much erosion. So a lot of elephant grass and uh, bamboo and uh, other types of uh, things that have stickers on them that live in that area. So I wanted to show that. So uh, when I talk about the perils of Pauline here, that uh, you'll know about what I'm going through. OK, I'm going to leave this map up for a long time. But uh, you'll see two blue ovals. The uh, bottom left blue oval is in northern Thailand. It's our, at our base at Udorn, Thailand. Uh, I was flying with the triple nickel of the 555th Fighter Squadron, or compatriot squadron is the 13th, which uh, Tony Marshall is a member of. The next uh, oval to the right is Nakhon Phnom Air Base, and that's where the uh, rescue helicopters and the A-1 Sandys that escorted the uh, helicopters, that's where they lived, and that distance is about 100 miles. The red uh, oval at the top is uh, Hanoi, the uh, capital of North Vietnam. It's the capital of all of Vietnam now, but uh, that's uh, what we called bullseye for our uh, reference point. The white oval uh, is on the western side of uh, where my uh, camping permit was. But uh, I will be shot down northwest of Hanoi uh, between, uh, you, you probably can't see it very well, there's a northeastern railroad that goes out of downtown Hanoi to China. There's a northwestern railroad that goes northwest out of Hanoi to China, and also the Red River runs along that. 
And in that piece of pie, if you uh, consider it uh, like a wedge, in uh, our intelligence briefings, uh, before we went to fly, they told us that because of the attrition of the rescue forces in 1966 and 67 of being very unsuccessful at making rescues in that area, that we can't afford to lose airplanes up there. So if you are shot down in that area, your job is to get somewhere else. So, so I'm going to be in that predicament here in, a, in about a couple sentences. Uh, so it was either go out to the uh, out feet wet and have the Navy pick you up or go southwest to Hanoi about 80 miles into some high terrain and that's normally where the Air Force was hanging out with their uh, rescue forces when we went in and out of Hanoi. Again, uh, for a judge of distance from Udorn, that, that bottom left blue oval to the red ring up at uh, Hanoi is the same distance as between right here and Vancouver, British Columbia. So it's the same mileage. It's a little uh, about 250 some miles. So a little bit farther than you can walk, even if you got on the interstate and started walking. But uh, so I guess I better get on with the, the, the perils here. On the 10th of May, uh, there was 32 airplanes that had laser-guided bombs, F-4s, that took off from an air base. I don't have it marked, but if you go to the right blue oval and then go down about 100 miles, is an air base called Ubon. So we, our job, uh, knowing that there was 32 airplanes that are going to laser guide bomb the Paul Doomer Bridge in downtown Hanoi, and they had some other targets in that area, I was in a four ship of uh, Air Force called Oyster, our call sign, and we were uh, called MIGCAP or Combat Air Patrol. Our job was to tie up any and all MIGs. Uh, north of Hanoi to keep them off the strike packages that was coming in from the south. There was also a, a F-4 flight right behind us from the 13th Squadron called Balter Flight. And then 15 minutes later, we had two more replacement flights. So that was our plan for, uh, for us up there to uh, tie up uh, anything to the north. On the way up, uh, the time on target was 10 o'clock in the morning. At about 9.45 in the morning, we had departed our tanker in northeastern Laos. That's the country uh, between the ovals. And there was uh, multiple flights of bandits or uh, enemy aircraft airborne. What is going to happen is our flight is going to tie up two flights of uh, uh, four, uh, four MiG-21s each. My front seater, Bob Lodge, and I, uh, we shoot down the first uh, MiG-21 coming down. We had a wingman, John Markle, off uh, about a quarter mile sideways. Uh, he fires two AIM-7s, and they both hit his airplane, or the, uh, the enemy airplane. We are climbing up at about a 15 degree climb angle to take on subsequent airplanes. Uh, we see Markle's airplane, or his uh, enemy aircraft being shot down as we climb up like through the ceiling here. Uh, uh, there was the, we saw the airplane that we had shot down, had the left wing shot off, and it was just uh, rotating and down. The pilot had already ejected. Uh, Steve Ritchie and Chuck DeBelvie are number three aircraft in the flight that day. They're about at mile and a half sideways from us to the left. And I hear them uh, start to talk on the radio that they have uh, contact and tally-ho with the enemy. Uh, right about now, between me and the corner of the room over here, there's a MiG-21 that comes into our flight, and he screws up. He is trying to roll out behind us. And he rolled out right in front of us between here and the exit sign. Uh, in the back of this room. And we're going up at about a 15 degree climb angle. And all we're going to do is when we fall off, and we had plenty of power to stay behind him and he's standing on the afterburner. We're going to blast him on the way down. That was our plan. Well, all good things come to an end. 
and about the time we're getting ready to blast this guy, uh, Markle says, lead break right, and then whomp. It felt, anybody here has ever been rear-ended in a car wreck, that's what it felt like. Uh, smoke and fumes in the cockpit. This guy separates away from us. It was kind of illogical to me that how can this guy accelerate away from us? That's because we're falling apart. Uh, we got hit with 30 millimeter, uh, probably in the right engine because we had hard yaw to the right, smoke and fumes in the cockpit, big fireball out on the right wing, and then our flight path starts coming down. Uh, I don't realize that uh, we had the big one yet. I've uh, been flying this airplane for a long time. feels nice, nice to be there. Uh, maybe we can turn and go back to the southwest. I don't remember what Bob said. A little bit later, it was maybe we can engage the autopilot and save some hydraulic fluid. And he says, Rog, you don't understand. We don't have any hydraulics. And that's when I realized that the stick was moving and the aircraft was essentially out of control. Well, it was out of control. Now, when I talk to air crews, uh, I talk to them about delayed decisions to eject from an airplane. It's still not soaking in that we've had the big one. But at some point, it was getting very hot, and what caught my attention was passing 8,000 feet above sea level. And I said, I've got to get out of the airplane. My front seater says, well, why don't you eject then? There's a story that goes with that, and I can talk with anybody after, afterwards about it. So it was all I could do is get to the lower handle and pull and what seemed like forever. Finally, the, the canopy started to come up and then I could hear, couldn't see, I could hear what's probably four seconds. Uh, came right up underneath the parachute going uh, in an oscillation motion. Two MiG-19s went past me. I saw one of them pull up. I thought they might come around to try to strafe me in the chute. I'm probably about 40 seconds from the ground. Uh, had I had to manually, if that ejection seat system had not worked automatically, I would not be here today. There wouldn't have been enough time to manually figure out that the canopy didn't come off, which it has to do for this ejection seat. And then if the canopy came off and the seat didn't move, how to cut myself from the suit and roll over the side like you see in the 12 o'clock high movies. And then find your D-ring and pull it before. So I got out of the airplane. I'm, boy, it's nice and cool. It's not getting hot. And then I'm in a predicament. I could see where our airplane had hit the ground to the northeast about a quarter of a mile down the hill in those, like those trees. This is my first real jump. I've had pulled up behind pickup trucks, you know, where they take you up parasailing, but uh, this is different. But uh, <laughs> come down through the trees and uh, just barely touched the ground. Uh, and when I got out of my parachute, it pulled the, the risers way up. I, so they, I was seen in the chute. My chute stuck in the trees. I got to get out of here. All I could hear was, uh, the aircraft uh, burning down the hill. So I knew I wanted to go, my, my plan of evasion was to go southwest 90 miles on my own, two miles a day. Geez, that's a month and a half, but that was my plan. So it took about two hours for me to get up to the ridge line behind me, to the southwest in the direction I wanted to go. And I went down the western slope a couple hundred yards, and then I laid down and started covering myself up with, uh, with trash or leaves or whatever is on the jungle floor. Uh, it was very similar to the training I had at Clark Air Base uh, at our jungle school on the way. Almost immediately, there was uh, adult males. I thought they tracked me. I tried to keep from being tracked. But they had spent the, the rest of the day from the ridge line behind me all the way down to the northeast looking for me. But I was on the other side. Uh, I didn't move till it was dark and then moved down some more. The next morning, they came up with women and kids. It was exactly like they run us through at snake school, is what we call it, at the Philippines in Clark. It's to get you to move. 
If you don't move, they can't really see it. Fortunately, they had no dogs. So all day, the second day, they're from the ridge line behind me, up and down, up and down, where the crash site is. The next morning, it rained before first light, and then I realized there's nobody up here, so I made about another half a mile down the hill, covered up, and then from that point on, I'm getting away for their looking for me. So to, in general now, uh, I get away from the immediate area, and now for a couple weeks, I'm going to be living the American dream of survival training, of which uh, I had some up here at Spokane, north of Spokane, and then some of it was growing up on the farm and going hunting in Kansas, and maybe some of it was luck. But uh, there's some stories about critters uh, I can save till later. Uh, but uh, the long story short is I got away. Now, as far as food and what have you, uh, it was too early in the season. I didn't have any food except two Pillsbury Space Sticks on me, which are like Tootsie Rolls, and I ate those in the first day. I had plenty of water. It was uh, kind of the wet season. And uh, I really didn't have anything to speak of to eat. So what's going to happen over this period of time, I'll just get cut to the chase for, because people want to know about, well, eating. The first seven days, the heat was on. I didn't have time to think about it. Days seven through about 14, every time I closed my eyes, I thought about all these big meals that you've had in the past and the Christmas meals. And in my uh, barracks at the Udorn in the refrigerator was a fruit cake my aunt sent me for Christmas, and I hadn't eaten it yet. Uh, I also had 38 bucks on me, and I couldn't buy a hamburger, nor could I buy any fried rice at Angel's Truck Stop at the, uh, for breakfast. So, and then after about two and a half weeks, I didn't care. I found myself not caring about eating anymore. It was one of those things that I could turn it off if I wanted to. It was okay. Or if I wanted to think about it, then it bothered me because uh, I was not going to uh, put just anything down in my mouth. There's one story about taro root, uh, like elephant ear, taro root, tapioca. Uh, there was some, something I remember reading about it that it was in red writing and I uh, couldn't remember. So I got a taro root one day, took it down, I could go down to the stream, clean it up, cut it up like a slice of potato, chomp, 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 swallow, and it was like fish hooks. And, man, I can't hardly breathe. I got to put fingers down my throat, keep my, so I could breathe. I'm salivating like a dog. And I said, I'm not going to do this again. It took about a half an hour to recover from it. Okay, any food scientists in here? Anybody make a living with, with uh, food molecules? The, the starch on the tapioca has a a protein substance around it. And then under a microscope, it looks like a cockaburr. And the red writing was, you're supposed to cook it and change it out because then it, everything turns to mush and it's okay. So I was very reluctant of what I, what I put in, the, uh, in my mouth. I was very, I never put anything that was red in my mouth. I know that was... <laughs> uh, I'm behind time making two miles a day. I also have stayed off my survival radio. I had two of them because my uh, contract was to get to where they could pick you up. I, I'm still east of the Red River. I gotta, gotta get out that direction. So I try to, uh, try to make some miles and then uh, by after about the two weeks, I could figure out the, how the people operated. I was in a rural area, down below in the valleys were the villages and the rice paddies. Up the hill is where the people would go up and cut down logs and slide them down the, the drainage uh, down to collect them. Uh, also, a first light in the morning, the uh, birds started chirping, uh, pots and pans, you hear fire, pots and pans, women talking, 
pots and pans, kids crying, adult men talking. And after about uh, two hours, they went to work. They dispersed. So that was my time to, uh, to move. Oh, it had been coming down in lower elevation uh, just because I was going to have to cross a river valley. And on one morning, I decide I'm going to make some good time. They tell you to stay off the trails. Well, if you just get off the edge of a trail, it's better than going through everything that has stickers. So I'm making good time on the edge of the trail, and I heard some kids behind me already. This is probably about 7 o'clock in the morning. So I run up over this one little ridge thinking I, I'm trying to see the Red River, and I can't. So I went to the north side, went about 50 yards off their trail, covered up again with all the pulling stuff over me like you're, you know, when you do the yard work and rake leaves and then you crawl under it. That's kind of the best way to describe it. And I saw the tops of these kids' heads. They went probably 50 yards south, and they went, I'm laying flat with my feet uh, going west. Anyhow, they cross to the west of me and about over here to the, uh, to the food line. Uh, it's like a switch went on in my eardrum. It's pots and pans, kids and women. Didn't hear any dogs. Geese. I almost evaded into a village, and it's 7 o'clock in the morning. And I wanted to get up and go back where I came from, but I couldn't because then they would see me because I was, went through some pretty open terrain getting there. So here I am, stuck. Probably about, I'm thinking about day 13. <laughs> uh, so the, in the morning, there was an adult male that went behind me. Uh, there, the trees were planted in rows, and it's chop, chop, crash, chop, chop, crash, then chop, chop, whittle, whittle, scrape, scrape. He's uh, making things out of some pretty good-sized bamboo, smoking a cigarette and whistling. After about an hour, he goes to do something else. Then they had their noon meal. Then they take their nap. They take about an hour and a half nap. Then back to work. And then towards evening, two boys went behind me, and then I hear... There's things coming towards me. I'm laying flat on my back, my head pointed east. And uh, I hear some things going to the right, to the left, and I figure out, oh, they're bringing in the water buffalo. They're bringing in their cattle for the evening. And uh, the, then I hear these, there's two kids way to the back, and they're coming, and then, according to my ears, I don't hear any left or right movement. So I'm thinking, gosh darn it, they're going to walk right on me, but I'm not moving. Uh, my mantra was, I'm in a bad position. If they want me, they're going to have to stand on me to get me. Well, a couple of minutes later, lots of noise, crunching, snapping behind me, and hear breathing, and two kids are really beating the heck out of the whatever it is. Well, it's a water buffalo. And I feel a weight go across my right thigh, I got, I'm laying my head, but I'm not going to turn my head and knock the camouflage off to see what it is. Okay, ready, psychology majors? Because if I don't see them, they don't see me. <laughs> well, what happened? And then one kid, then it got quiet. One kid ran to the village. I said, this is it. They're going to get Grandpa with the gun and police me up, but I'm not moving. Well, they came out with a bigger brother, and a lot of whacking and beating behind me, and then I heard a grunt. The weight went off my leg, and by that time I can turn my eyeball, and I see the rear end of a water buffalo, first boy, second boy, third boy trips. I thought he tripped on my leg, and he gets up and keeps on moving. So after about a half an hour, put my heart back in the flight suit, um, I looked up, and there was no camouflage on my right, from my right thigh, and there was my GI boot sticking out in the breeze. So what had happened is this one water buffalo sees a pile of trash, he can smell there's a human in it, and he's not going past. And then these kids couldn't keep him going, and they got him to come up far enough that he stepped on a sapling, and that was what the weight. So that's as close as they got to me. Had they been looking for me, they probably would have found me. Had they had a dog, I'd have been had. Any, anywhere along there, had they had a, a, a canine, I probably would have 
I would have been found. It would have been game over. Uh, so they took their supper, come on, darkness, and I waited till it was dark. And in that area, they had no electricity, so when it got dark, they went to bed. I've been doing good so far. Let me just wait a little bit longer. And these two boys are obviously juvenile delinquents. Uh, <laughs> they come out, and they're just smoking a cigarette, because I can smell them, and they're giggling and having a good time. Then they finally go to bed. A half hour later, I get up, go around the back side of the village, up into, like you saw in that picture before, up through where they had uh, gardens and things, and where they had secondary growth, and up into the, the original uh, trees. So, I took the next day off. I'm still a free man. I guess it's about 14, day 14, I think. Uh, I really wasn't writing down the dates. Uh, then I go through a period of time, and I'll, I'll dwell a little bit on it, that it's very, very easy to get in the woe is me, I am in a hell of a predicament, I don't have any hope, why do I even bother trying? So it is, I'm, I'm in a tough place, I need to go about another 80 miles, if it's anything like almost going into this village, which I know there's going to be more when you get to the river valley itself, I will probably be caught. So I went through the training that I had uh, that I could remember. I couldn't remember the tap code, that one letter you don't do. And I thought, boy, I didn't listen very good at survival school. So I was worried about that. Uh, I was wasting away as far as uh, uh, physical uh, strength goes. Uh, I probably ate three or four handfuls of things I felt found off the ground, like uh, the, the year before, the, in the fall before, some type of tropical hard fruit that fell down to the ground. Uh, I had plenty of water, so that wasn't a problem. And I was getting water from bamboo and also uh, from banana trunks that I didn't have to purify. And then I was getting some water from a stream that I had to put an iodine tablet in. But I was essentially faring for myself. Nobody knows I'm up here. I stayed off the radio. I didn't want to be direction found by the enemy. Time ticks by, and I was shot down on the 10th of May, so I figured I got to get back to military control. I could probably stay up here and die. You know, just starve to death. Well, that isn't why I ejected. So I got to make the effort to get back. Okay, so I will do it. I'm going to start moving on the 1st of June, because if they get me and they work me over, if I divulge information, it ought to be old information. So that was my plan. It, it had rained all night, the 31st of May, and I, it was the first night I shivered. So it might have been uh, hypothermia or whatever. And I overslept. So by the time I woke up, the people are down below working in the rice paddies. Darn. Another day up here swatting mosquitoes. But I'm still free. About 9 o'clock in the morning, I hear this whoomp. What the heck was that? Whoomp. I looked out to the southwest, and over by the airfield, the N Bay airfield, I'd seen where they fired some surface air missiles. So I knew that we had some American airplanes. I was not going to use my radio unless I could identify an American airplane by sight. I we had plenty of MiGs flying around, but I didn't want to be direction found by the enemy because I still needed to go another 80 miles. I didn't want to have the Army coming up looking for me. So I figured I better at least say something, and all I wanted to do is get the word out. And uh, in about uh, 15 seconds, there are two flights of F-4s on the radio. I says, any U.S. aircraft, if you read Oyster 1 Bravo, come up guard. It was two flights that came up. I says, just pass the word. This is Oyster 1 Bravo. Just pass the word. I'm about 10 miles west of where I went down, and I'm okay. And that's all I wanted to get out was now, instead of being a... a uh, went down in a fireball with no shoots and no beacons heard that uh, I'm now an MIA. 
So that was my uh, goal. About 10 minutes later, uh, uh, Fletch was the name of the flight, called back and says, uh, we passed the word to King. That was the uh, rescue uh, coordination aircraft. And he says, the Jollies and Sandys are on their way. It was such a heavy uh, on my shoulders thinking that they're, I'm still in this area where you don't come in. But I didn't tell them not to come. Uh, in about 10 minutes, uh, Sandy One is on the radio. He says, Oyster One Bravo, come up guard. And I did. And he's, when, when you go into combat, you leave, you know, in the old days, four questions and answers similar as what you do for your computer nowadays. And so he, right off the bat, asked one of, the, uh, one of my authenticator questions, which I got right. And they, that didn't cut any water with those guys. And I wasn't about to tell them exactly where I was. So we danced around the radio for a little bit. And then uh, what they did is they brought the helicopters in from the west a little bit. And then I heard uh, a lot of uh, anti-aircraft shooting down to the south. And I could see that. And they were talked about they're getting shot at. So I took out my compass and I says, Sandy, I'm 015 degrees, second ridge line, a third of the way down. He says, Yeah, we know about where you're at, but we gotta get out of here. And boom, there they went. Gone. That's the first of June, twenty twenty second day. So here I am. It's nice and quiet. People are still working down in the uh, down in the rice paddies. Is this going to be the day it's fried rice time at Angel's Truck Stop or tomorrow? Or maybe not at all. So I really, was, I really didn't expect them to come back, but they might. That afternoon, they sent a, uh, a forward air control fast mover up to the west, and I could hear the guy looking, or I could hear him looking for me on the radio, but he couldn't hear my voice. He couldn't hear my beacon. So I figured he's at least 40 miles away because that's about the... the capability. And I even heard him check in with the uh, Kingbird that no contact with Oyster One Bravo. So I was convinced that, well, that was it. Uh, the rest of the story then, that afternoon, General Vogt, V-O-G-T, was the 7th Air Force commander, and he was very concerned that in this period of time, the last couple months, we had lost a lot of air crews and we had very few successful pickups. And he quizzed the, uh, the Sandy guys and the helicopter guys, do you think this guy's in a position that we could try to get him? And they said, well, we think we can, but you know, we need all these other things. So General Vogt made a decision about seven o'clock that evening that we're gonna try to get this guy out tomorrow morning, and he's gonna use all his sorties in 7th Air Force which was about 130 to 40 of all types of aircraft to make an effort. There was one other thing, a uh, pitch for the maintenance troops. There was one, then they needed three helicopters to be ready the next morning to get two up to the site. Well, the third one had landed near NKP, Nakhon Phnom, with a transmission light. And there was uh, two truckloads of enlisted troops, mechanics that went out there to get that thing fixed to fly it back onto the airstrip to get it ready for the morning go. So morning of 2 June comes, I figured now, now I can probably listen to my radio more than I have in the past. And there was uh, one of my buddies who was uh, up looking for me. I says, uh, I, he says, Oyster One Bravo, come up voice, come up guard, and I did. He says, well, he sure took a long time to check in, but he passed the word. And I thought, okay, that's about 6 o'clock in the morning. In the meantime, people go to work. It's quiet, birds, another day up here in paradise. Will this be the day it's fried rice time at Angel's Truck Stop? Not really sure. Well, it took him three hours to get up there. And about 9 o'clock, I hear airplanes. There are four F-4s come in and bomb the south end of the N Bay airfield. Four ship comes in, bombs the north end of the airfield. Another four ship goes through a hole in the cloud. 
So in about a minute's time, there's 12 F-4s at the airfield next to me. Almost immediately, there's Sandy 1. Hey, Oyster, come up, uh, come up voice, come up guard. And I did. <clears throat> and he says, uh, okay, Oyster, I got one question for you, and you better answer it right. <laughs> no problem. I've been, I know the other three. And he says, what's kites? I knew what kites was, but that wasn't one of my three. I says, kites? He says, yeah, kites, kites. What's kites? Well, at Kansas State, that's the beer joint right out the, uh, the back gate. <laughs> and the question came from an intel officer that was at UDORN, who was a year behind me in ROTC. That's where the question came from. I says, a place to drink beer, man. You know, in the 70s, we said man quite a bit. And, and what seemed uh, for a long time, he says, drink what? Beer. Uh, you sound like the one I want. <laughs> and I says, you damn right, I'm the one you want. So according to the, uh, those guys, uh, they had no doubt that I was, didn't have a gun to my head as a trap. Well, it took about another 15 minutes before I, could, I couldn't hear them. I was more forthcoming in my position. Finally, uh, I saw a Sandy one down. I says, if you go back to where you got shot at the day before, I can vector you in. And he says, thanks a lot, buddy. But that's essentially what he did. So I got a visual on him. Uh, I said, I'm 015, second ridge line, third of the way down. He says, okay, stand by. So then he put in uh, flak suppression down at the, uh, the, to the south of me. There were some gun sites. They had explosions from the ammunition. There's black smoke, white smoke going up to the moon. Gave him my position. He said, okay, have all your stuff ready. We'll be back. So they went uh, out west of the river, picked up the helicopters in what seemed like forever and ever and ever because the people were still working down below on the rice paddies even though there's an airstrike, you know, five miles on the other side of the ridge line. I think I hear an airplane. I know I hear an airplane. I'm looking to the southwest. Here comes the first Sandy by. I says, Sandy, I'm off your left wing. Two and three come by. The sun's over here. I hit number three in the eye with a mirror, tally-ho, from the reflection. And they started a defensive turnaround. And then they started dropping a smoke screen. I thought, geez, boy, talk about giving my position away. <laughs> and then, uh, Sandy says, Oyster, you're not going to believe this. I've got a uh, jolly green, a mile in trail, hold your beacon down. And when I give this pitch to air crew, when we talk about the law of armed conflict, at that point I would have been a dangerous man with my weapon. Up until that time I had no hope of being rescued. Well, anyhow. About a minute later, I hear a heavy helicopter coming. Let's go to the next slide here. Okay. And uh, here comes the Jolly Green over me as fast as he could run. I says, Jolly just flew over me. He did a hard turn. I hit his co-pilot in the eye with a mirror, tally-ho. Over the top, lowered the jungle penetrator. Wait for it to hit the ground. They pulled me up a little bit farther down, reeled me up. They tell you never ever help the para-jumper get, out, uh, get off the penetrator because we had people fall off. So I'm hanging on, this big guy takes a slack out, slams him down on the floor, rips my hands off of it. Another para-jumper puts this big uh, green go coffee can in my bosom. And I roll around, I find they're moving. I roll around, I get up, and it's full of cookies. So I'm <laughs> stuffing cookies down my face. I had the radios out of my radio pouch. I'm stuffing cookies in the radio pouch because I don't think we're getting out of here and I'm not getting shot down twice with nothing to eat. <laughs> well, it took an hour and a half then to get out of North Vietnam. We had to refuel behind the HC-130 uh, in the northeastern Laos, otherwise we would have had to land up there and find a friendly airfield that had good fuel and 55-gallon drums. But, uh, and it took uh, another hour and a half, so it took me three hours to get back to Udorn. Uh, that's General Vogt. Uh, he's the guy that said, let's try to get this guy out. 
Now I come out of there, here's a, a captain grabbing a four-star general by the shirt sleeve, because I'm not sure what I, I, I have a hard time keeping my balance, but I'm tripping on something. I don't know if it was a chalk or whether it was pavement was screwed up, but I was falling into him. Uh, so I was a very grateful person. And by the way, I'd shaved twice during the ground, so that's uh, like only about a week's worth there. Uh, and then Angel took this picture. Uh, you'd think all I did is drink beer, but uh, <laughs> there was a guy in our squadron uh, who had come back from this. First of all, Angel couldn't get Coors. She'd get Heineken, couldn't get Coors. You'd get rusty uh, Budweiser but uh, in cans. But here's a Coors, and then this gentleman in the front with a hat on is a hospital commander uh, who's, who's grabbed me, and he's leading me to the, uh, the paddy wagon to take me to get deloused at the uh, hospital. So that's essentially my story. Had it not been for people who put their life on their line to come out to try to get one individual, I probably would have spent time with, with Mr. Marshall here, uh, probably about 10 months. I probably would have learned a lot, but I was a very fortunate person, and whether it was luck, it was some, a lot of luck, but there was a lot of teamwork that went into it, and a lot of people's lives were at risk to get me out. So that's my story. I will stick around afterwards to talk to anybody who wants to talk about it, but I appreciate the uh, opportunity uh, to come out to uh, Portland, and thanks for your support. Thank you, Roger. What an awesome story of strength, endurance, and courage.